I want to first thank you all for joining us for this July 27th meeting of the British Empire Study Group. Thank you for getting up in the morning, enjoying your coffee here in uh, the United States, or if you're in England, I guess you're winding down your day. So we are the British Empire Study Group, and we are a bunch, we are philatelists who just enjoy the social aspect and learning about different things. So. So at, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Robert Lutens, to introduce Alex Heyman. Thank you so much, Joan. Welcome everyone to this morning's presentation, The Clash of Empires for a Glimpse into the 1879 Anglo-Zulu War, Part Two. On January 11th, 1879, British and colonial forces invaded the Zulu kingdom, igniting one of the most famous conflicts of the Victorian era. This month, July of 2023, the Spear Museum of Philatelic History at the Royal Philatelic Society of London is hosting a public exhibition displaying more than 500 postal, historical, and cultural objects, exploring the contexts, history, and ongoing legacy of this clash of empires. The exhibition's narrative begins in the early years of the 19th century with the emergence of King Shaka Kazan Sanyaktana and the rise of the Zulu kingdom and takes us through to 2019, 140 years after the start of the 1879 Anglo-Zulu War. We'll learn more about this iconic historical event through postal history and artifacts with the guidance of the exhibition's co-curator, Alexander Hyman. Alex is a longtime student, researcher, and collector of Anglo-Zulu history. From 2005 until 10, Alex worked as a collection specialist for the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. Since 2010, Alex has been a volunteer leader with numerous philatelic organizations, including the American Philatelic Society, New York World Stamp Show from 2016, Stockholmia in 2019, and the Royal Philatelic Society of London. In 2015, Alex launched the initial effort culminating with the current Clash of Empires exhibition. So, Without further ado, our presenter this morning, Alexander Hyman. Well, thank you, Rob, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I just want to confirm that my audio and, and video is coming through. Joan, are we good? Everything's oh. fine, Alex. Excellent. Well, we have a, a very interesting hybrid experience ahead of us. So we are live from the exhibition at 15 Ave Church Lane in the city of London at the Royal Philatelic Society London. Uh, we're going to do, as we did two weeks ago, but even a more in-depth dive uh, into the artifact-driven exhibition experience that we have, um, you'll, which you're going to get a deep look at now. Welcome to everyone around the world that's joining us. It's a bit of a, an unusual experience, and maybe it's probably a first for uh, this group's and all the presentations that have been done and organized, because we also have a live audience uh, that's actually with me. I'm not going to scan the camera in their direction, but there's a, there's a quite sizable group here that's going to be following along. So I'm going to have an in-person component, a virtual component. We've got comments. Uh, so it, we're, this is sort of breaking new ground in how we think about bringing artifacts and knowledge uh, and this incredible story and dynamic history uh, to the broadest possible audience around the world. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll do my best here, but uh, 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 thanks and apologies in advance for, uh, for uh, back and forth that we may have, but I welcome the audience here and announced it in the gallery that for them to also ask questions and participate. So if, if I get a question on my side here, I'll repeat the question so everyone else can hear it because uh, I have a microphone that, so the audience here cannot hear what's happening. Um, but we're gonna get going. And the last time you'll see me is right now. So we're gonna turn over here to the first case. So. Um, I'm just going to give you a scan of the room to give a sense of what we're about to explore. And the purpose of this exhibition, as I said, is to be an artifact-driven narrative experience. And by the way, my apologies to all my everyone live, but I'm not looking straight at you. I'm, again, I'm the cameraman as well as the narrator of our tour. Um, there are over 550 artifacts that cover a broad range uh, from the early 19th century and the, and the early origins and formation of the Zulu kingdom, all the way to the present day, covering across postal items, letters, uh, philatelic pieces, three-dimensional artifacts, militaria, um, and about 50 other categories of artifact here. And it really is a, an extraordinary opportunity to dive into all the tangible parts of history. And that's exactly what we're gonna do here. 
recognizing that I have a, a large virtual audience, I'm going to do my best to try to make this as real and up close as I possibly can. Um, but again, there's nothing quite like being uh, live and in person. And my thanks to everyone that is here live that has come to the exhibition. We're nearing uh, 2,000 attendees that have walked uh, through the doors here uh, in the month that we've been on. Uh, and it's been an extraordinary response. And uh, we have attendees at, at, from at least 28 countries that have also visited the exhibition. Uh, so we're really proud of, of all of this. And many thanks to everyone, uh, the volunteers and others. Um, while I'm at the beginning of this, before I forget, I need to move my camera over here to our, our sponsor and donor board, uh, especially for the Philatelic and Polster world. There are a number of people to thank, um, starting with our presenting sponsor, Cherry Stone Auctions, uh, that underwrote the, the primary focus of our exhibition. Um, we have also uh, Robert A. Siegel Auction Galleries and Skylar Rumsey Philatelic Auctions uh, that are also here uh, as supporting sponsors of the exhibition, as well as Anna Lee from Phila China and the Sandawana Lodge, all as supporting sponsors. A number of other individuals, many from throughout the American uh, and greater philatelic world have been supporters at various levels. And my thanks as well as everyone else associated with this exhibition for making all of this possible. So thank you so very much. So now moving back over to uh, see what we're going to explore, we start in chapter one. Um, so the story really begins in the early 19th century with the formation of the Zulu kingdom. It's basically Alex? a small, yes? Excuse me, Alex. I'm sorry, again, because we have such a large aud virtual audience, could you slow down your speech so that way it catches up to? Yes the video uh, you know, yes. thank you very much sorry no 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 Joan I, I told you we, we interrupted we want to make as best <laughs> experience as possible it's a, you know the desire to try to give to try to do what could be done in three or four hours and to try to, to condense it down into our time uh, so I will I will definitely do my best to uh, to slow to catch up with the video feed so just yeah stop it's me just if, the, if yeah, the audio again. seems to uh, to lag so generally if you slow down your speech rate then then uh, then it will catch up but thanks okay Excellent. No, I've, that's a great, great point on the on to connect the, the audio and the video. All right. At the very beginning of the 19th century in the 18 teens, uh, a charismatic figure uh, in King in Chief Shaka, later King Shaka, the first king of the Zulus, comes together th with a combination of uh, military prowess and diplomacy to bring a series of tribes together in the northeastern part of southern africa so here just as an example is a modern illustration based on testimony and and uh, and first-hand accounts from that era of king shaka um, i'm going to just give some context for everyone here to give a sense of where we are so once again we're in southern africa this is a map from the 1870s and as best i can in this filmed version i hope this is coming through but right over here on the left side is cape town founded by the dutch in the early 1600s as a waypoint of, of shipping as you rounded africa and between the early 1600s and 1806 the dutch are in possession of this area and mostly are in the western part of what is now south africa or southern africa the zulu kingdom forms in the farthest northeast part of what is today south africa on the indian ocean coast so over the 200 years, early 1600s to early 1800s, there is some eastward movement of Dutch descendants and settlers. And in 1806, when the British take over as a result of the Napoleonic Wars, that is what starts to lead a, a constant and continuous progression of both Dutch descendant settlers and British uh, in an eastward motion, uh, which leads to a series of wars, which we'll talk about, and eventually to the border of the Zulu kingdom by the mid 19th century. So again, we're, our story very much is in what is today South Africa, in the modern state of KwaZulu-Natal, and the Zulu kingdom is as far away from uh, Cape Town, uh, the first uh, European settlement in Southern Africa. And so it's, the, it's sort of the end progression of this history that we're going to focus on. So there are a number of artifacts in this first chapter to focus on. I'm going to emphasize the Zulu shields here. There are 12 Zulu shields from the 1879 period on display. In brief, the Zulu shields are the main um, regimental insignia of the Zulu army, instituted in the form that it will take in 1879 by King Shaka in the 18 teens and 20s. The shields re are representative of the age banded regiments Basically, the younger the regiment, the darker the color of the shield. These are all cowhide shields from Nguni cattle. Two shields uh, can be made, one from each side of the of the hide of a of of a of a, of a cow. And the lighter the shield, like this one I'm showing you here, which is very similar in, in the one that the King Shaka was known to have, with the pattern of all white with one brown spot. 
the lighter or whiter the shield, the more senior in terms of age and experience the regiment. So darker shields, younger regiments, lighter shields, and so forth. While we're on the topic of shields, I'm just going to show that we have two shields in case two. This is, of course, not so simple to show in this video form. But if you notice, just in the view I'm showing here, the large brown dark pattern on the left side, and on the right side, you have the white spot, this large white spot. In case number three, you have a similar pattern hide, same regimental shield, which has the large brown and a, and a white spot on the right side. These are of the same regiment. So it gives you a sense of how the, the Zulu regimental system worked. And if you consider what these colors meant when you have large masses of warriors in regimental formation, uh, from a chief's perspective on high, looking down, you could see just based on the color patterns, they would know which regiments, the age of the regiments, so the younger, quicker, uh, young, uh, younger regiments you have over here, and then another area you've got my, your more senior, more disciplined uh, warriors in another part, and it's how uh, warrior battlefield engagement in the Zulu army would take place. The shields belong to the Zulu king. You did service for the king in these age-banded regiments, um, so that's just the, the nature of the shields. You'll be seeing these as we go through. The shields are meant to, uh, to give you an overwhelming presence as you are physically here in the galleries that that the Zulu War, uh, you know, really is fought within Zululand, and it's you know, and the shields and the, and the Zulu King are not not too far away. From a postal perspective, there are two uh, there are two envelopes and their associated letters, both from 1861. One on the left here even indicates that it is the Zulu Scare, and it's from uh, July of 1861. And over here, sent from Natal, which is the colony immediately to the west of Zululand. And on this side, there's another letter sent from the Cape of Good Hope on the far western part of the country, just written a month later, and they're describing the exact same event, which was a, 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 a conflict within Zululand between pr several princes that led to a mass exodus of the supporters of two of the princes out of Zululand, leading to tens of thousands of refugees, Z Black Zulu native refugees, into the colony of Natal. And there was a big concern about, about the sort of unstable nature of the movement of people across the border and what the results were going to be, each letter references a, quote, King Cachueo. At the time, he was the dominant prince, and would not become king for another 10 years, but that King Cachueo uh, of what he would eventually become was the king of the Zulu War. So these are two of the earliest holster references, 18 years before the Zulu War breaks out, and gives you a sense, because Southern Africa is not a small place, but this news and what was happening in this far northeast corner is making its way all the way to Cape Town, and they're writing home, describing the Zulu army and everything that, the ex that they are aware of and how, how it all works. So these are early watercolor depictions from the 1840s and 1850s of early Zulu life. We have a series of other artifacts about average, typical, traditional uh, eating, uh, preparation. It's an agrarian society. We have a headrest here uh, as well as a headrest for sleeping. Uh, we have some uh, ceremonial brass work that was used in varying parts of Zulu traditional life uh, for honors uh, to various warriors and chiefs. So that gives you a sense of sort of the start of the conflict. Now, we move on to the next phase of the story, which is really the coming of the white soldier. It is a focus on the 1806 until 1878, right leading up to the Zulu War. This second case has a series of artifacts that are not only meant to introduce the concept of the progression of the colonial sort of military and movement of settlers across Southern Africa, but also to begin introducing critical players that will be part of what happens in our story related to the Zulu War. So right here on the far right here, we have Sir Bartle Frere, uh, who was the, the commissioner in Southern Africa at the time of the Zulu War, who was sent down there to institute a policy of confederation. Confederation was successfully instituted in Canada, or what is now Canada, in the 1860s to bring all the disparate colonial possessions that were in North America under British control in some form into a single political unit, and he was sent down there to do the same in Southern Africa. He is joined uh, right here by uh, Lord General Chelmsford. If my finger can come... Down, where's the camera? Right here, that's General Chelmsford. Uh, he was the main imperial uh, commander of imperial forces, British forces in Southern Africa at the time. And the two of them worked together to begin to institute or uh, initiate a conflict with the Zulus, which will lead to the war that we're going to talk about momentarily. But before we get to 1878, 
There are a series of other wars. There are nine frontier wars fought against the tribes in central and south and cent central East South Africa, in particular the Koza. So we have an example of a Koza warrior here uh, in, in the view. And then we have uh, a fold of letters from private soldiers written during the frontier wars. The one that I'm focusing on right here is from the seventh frontier war in the 1840s. To give you a sense of how the postal artifacts connect with the three-dimensional artifacts, this is a powder horn captured from uh, a chief during that uh, seventh frontier war in the 1840s, and then inscribed by the soldier that captured it. So again, the no one's writing letters just on their own with nothing happening around them. These artifacts and what's happening in the world that these soldiers are inhabiting is very much all an all-encompassing experience. When I mentioned about uh, figures that are going to get introduced soon, there is a, a, an envelope here uh, that included a telegram sent to Colonel Glynn of the 24th Regiment. We'll talk about him in a moment. We have an item here, a, a letter written by, um, at the time, Lieutenant Henry Pullane, uh, written in 1876 from King Williamstown. He'll also become important to our story. We have a cover sent by uh, Private Busby of the 24th. Let me get it in view here. Uh, sent also uh, right in the in the aftermath of the Ninth Frontier War in 1878, uh, or sorry, in lead up to the, the war in 1877. Uh, he'll become important to our story as well. So just to give you a sense, I'm going to back out here and give uh, a view of everything that's in this case. But again, trying to put the three-dimensional artifact, postal and non-postal, all side by side, more artifacts, unfortunately, than I'm able to, to talk about in this one view, but trying to give everyone a sense of what we have here Everything that is on display is available in the exhibition's book, which is available for sale through the Royal Philatelic Society London's online shop. Or if you can make your way to London for the next couple of days, it's available here as well to all of the to everyone that's live in our audience. All right, so here we go. The Zulu War gets underway. At the end of 1878, the, de the decision by Frere, uh, without the permission of the home government in London, is set where he is going to instigate a war with the Zulus by issuing an ultimatum cooked up basically by a border dispute and another issue on the border, which had previously been fairly peaceful with good relations between the Zulus and the, and the British colony of Natal up till that point. And it being the last remaining independent African kingdom on the border of, of, of the British colonial possessions, um, to Frere uh, was seen as a threat. And to remove that threat, he felt that his mission of confederation given to him by the home government would be made much easier. There are a number of artifacts in this case, which is all focused on the last couple months of 1878. So for example, here again is a picture of uh, Lord Chelmsford, the commander of, of Imperial troops. And this is a letter written by Chelmsford responding to a colonial gentleman who wants a commission in one of the colonial units. That they, were, they were gathering resources and supplies, getting ready for the invasion. It was very clear what was happening. And so uh, the, the general was getting a request for uh, citizens of the colony to join in the fight, everyone wanting a little glory in their, in their youth. There also was an anti-war sentiment that began to build. So here are two photographs of the same man. Let me make sure I've got these so being seen. Um, these are both, hold on, sorry, there we go. These are uh, two photographs of Bishop Colenso, as well as a letter written by him. Uh, the, he's the Anglican Bishop of Natal, and he is uh, very much against the war. And there is a famous quote by Benjamin Disraeli, the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, where he says, a remarkable, a remarkable people, the Zulus, they convert our bishops, they defeat our generals, and they bring an end to a mighty European dynasty. Convert our bishops is a reference to uh, Bishop Colenso, which you see right here. There are a number of artifacts, including a part of the colors, just the yellow stripes here, which belong to the King's Own Regiment's colors that followed them throughout the entire campaign in Zululand. This is a, a London Illustrated new graphic uh, print from December of 1878 of Queen Victoria giving the regiment the colors that these were a part of that went through the entire campaign. So again, objects really from the campaign attributable to being connected. Uh, so trying to get the connection between the physical and the postal. Now, uh, there's a letter here, which is very interesting, written by uh, Sir Bartle Frere, that uh, main uh, colonial administrator, written to uh, Colonel Glynn, who would be the commander of the central column, which we're going to hear a lot about. And he, it's in the lead up to the war, and he's basically saying, oh, I really enjoyed my visit to, uh, to you and your fellow officers. Thank you for hosting me. So there's lots of, you know, they're, they're, they're cheery, they're getting ready to go, and they, they think that it's all going to have a, a, you know, kind of a, a nice, nice sort of quick end. This is also an interesting envelope sent by uh, sent to Colonel Maud 
at the Royal Mews Buckingham Palace. And it's written by his son, who is an officer that would go in with the invasion. Uh, and just again, that the correspondence is going straight from the border of Zululand, eventually in the campaign, to the heart of power of the British Empire being sent directly to the, the uh, military secretary for Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace. There is one last item before we jump into the, to the, to the dramatic parts of our story here. And this is sent from Captain George Wardell. He is writing from Help Makar, and I've been to Help Makar. It is a real small, desolate place on the border between inside the colony, right on the border of Zuland. He's writing about less than two weeks before the invasion will get kicked off in early January of 1879. He has countersigned it to give himself per, uh, the permission to, uh, in manuscript, O H. Um, uh, on OHMS, uh, on Her Majesty's service. And the counter signature is in the bottom right uh, for George Wardell of the 1st the 24th Regiment at Help Makar for free service. Um, it will, you'll hear what happens to him in a moment. So why are we talking about the Zulu War 144 years later? What in the world could possibly with two dozen and more little conflicts of the Victorian era from the 1830s all the way to the Boer War what continues to drive the fascination, and it's all about what happens in January of 1879. In the gallery, we show many parts of what's coming. Um, there is a mountain called Isandawana, and it's showed in three different places across the gallery. So everyone that's physically live, that's the main mountain that you see here. Um, and it is a place that will stand out forever, connecting the Zulu people uh, and the British nation and what comes next. So. We have the run-up to invasion. As an example of artifacts, there are two envelopes in the frame right here, as well as their corresponding letters. They're written by Lieutenant Anstey of the 24th. One is right before the invasion begins at the start of January, and one is just as the invasion has started. He is writing to his father, and in his letters, he is every amount as buoyant as you could imagine, describing his desire to get to the front as quickly as possible, hoping that there will be a a quick and easy fight, but that it will be decisive and he will have a part to play. Uh, Lieutenant Anstey gets, uh, well, we are gonna see what happens to him in a moment. The central column, they invade along three different parts into Zululand. The central column is our focus right now. The main commanding general, General Chelmsford, joins the column, effectively superseding Colonel Glynn, who I've referenced before in moments before. This is where they camp. The view from the viewer's perspective, the view that you see over there to everyone live, is facing from the west or sorry, it's from the east facing west. So this is the view that the Zulus have facing the British camp. The British are camped in the, in the foot of this mountain facing to the east in the direction of the Zulu king and the Zulu capital. They begin, they camp there on January 20th, about nine days into the invasion. And the general is trying to figure out what to do. He's trying to figure out where the Zulu army is for hope that he can find the army and get them to commit to a fight so that he can bring the conflict to a close as quickly as possible. The whole idea here is they're doing this without the, the permission of the home government. So it's not to have a prolonged campaign. They want to get the Zulus to, 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 uh, to confront them in a battle. Little do they realize that the Zulus have no intention of fighting a, a guerrilla campaign across their own country. And they have formed up three armies, one each to confront the central invasion column. Or sorry, to confront each of the invasion columns, one for the central, one for the northern, and one for the coastal column. This case focuses in particular on the central column. On the 21st, uh, there are, in the late evening, there are some scouts of the British camp that discover to the southeast of the camp, so that is to the left direction of, of the photograph you see here, or the left of where the image is above in the gallery, that they think they have found the, the Zulu army. And Chelmsford decides to split his force, the more mobile portion of his force, to go and figure out if he can get the Zulu army to commit, to then call up his, his reserve guard, which is the other half of his camp at his Sendawana, and of course, uh, get the Zulus into a full front battle. He uh, parts uh, his camp and breaks uh, for half his force in the early morning hours of the 22nd. About 10 hours later at 10.30 in the morning, a scout from the camp that remains, about 1,700 British and colonial troops under the command of uh, Henry Polain. I pointed out a letter written by him three years earlier, uh, an officer of the 24th, finds uh, that there are some Zulus on a ridge that they see to their northeast, so in the opposite direction of where the general has gone with half the force, and they assume that they're going to be called up quickly to strike the camp and to move forward. They send, some, they send uh, a patrol up onto the ridge to the northeast, and as they peer over, they see 25,000 Zulu warriors who almost immediately rise up 
and begin their assault a bit earlier than they were than they were planning, but nonetheless begin their assault. They do it in a structure which becomes very famous in the movie Zulu with Michael Caine in the uh, the horns of the buffalo. Um, so they send a right flank a force in, uh, behind the same uh, area where the British are unable to see them from their camp. So it's basically on the right side area of the of the view of Isandawana Mountain, or the right side of what you see in the far image if you're in the gallery, sort of around that that far right side. The center, so the, the right horn is going that in that direction to outflank the British position. The center is going for a straight frontal attack against a series of firing lines the British camp set up. This battlefield is multi-miles long. It is simply massive. It is very difficult to give you a sense of scale, um, but it is huge. The, the left horn begins a flanking action on the left side of this, of this image, and they initially send a very mobile force under Colonel Durnford to handle and hold off that left horn. They do not realize that they are fighting the main Zulu army because, of course, the general who has gone off is fighting the main Zulu army. So this can't be what is confronting them. Between 1030 in the morning when the attack begins and about 2, 2.30 in the afternoon when the British camp is completely wiped out with over 1,300 British soldiers uh, uh, killed by the Zulu army, um, it is a complete and total uh, victory for the Zulus. They have uh, completely sacked the camp. It is the single greatest defeat of a British field force in the Victorian era. Dramatic and the complete opposite of what, of course, Bartle Frere and General Chelmsford have in mind for what they're trying to do in Zululand. I've showed several artifacts here. This first one about George Wardell and these next ones about Lieutenant Anstey riding on the eve of invasion. Both men would be killed at the Battle of Isandawana. These are some of the last artifacts of their uh, postal or any correspondence they send that really connect them uh, here with us uh, alive. This down here, this telegram right below Anstey's letters is the telegram that was sent to his parents in early February of 1879, notifying them of, his, of their son's death. There is another telegram here notifying another British family of the death of their, of their son. Um, Henry Pullane, the letter that we have from 1876 would also be killed at the Battle of Sundawana. It is um, a, a, just a, a tremendous disaster for the British and really, once again, a, an ama amazing and incredible victory for the Zulus. I'm going to skip to the present day to say that the Zulu nation and monarch commemorate their victory at the Battle of the Sandawana every year. I was fortunate in 2019 to be the token American with the British delegation to that commemoration event uh, at the battlefield. And it is uh, dramatic and they are very connected to this history and are proud of the success that they had uh, bloodying the nose of, uh, of such a massive empire with, with the British Army. So moving from this, I'm going to now uh, focus on something that if you may have seen a film with a young Michael Caine called Zulu, this case is particularly interesting for you. So at 2.30 in the afternoon, approximately, the Battle of Isandawana is finished. There are four regiments of the Zulu Army that have not made their way into the main fighting. Um, so they are um, the more senior regiments. They decide against the orders of the king to make their way across the Buffalo River and to attack a mission station with about 140 British and colonial troops at a place called Rourke's Drift. We are very fortunate in my, uh, to have had a diorama prepared for us by a very good friend of the exhibition. Um, and it is of the Battle of Rourke's Drift at 4.30 in the afternoon, the Zulus attack. So the view that, the, that you have here is actually now facing east. So Isandawana is in the distance, and as is the Buffalo River about maybe, uh, maybe about a, less than a half mile beyond is where the river, where the border is between the, the colony and, uh, and the Zulu kingdom. So initially the, the Zulus come in and they attack this frontal barricade that's been set up in front of the hospital. Now, there are two officers in charge here uh, that, are, that are important for the story. One, his name is John Chard, a Royal Engineer, played by Stanley Baker. John Chard will sit in his grave for eternity, and he will always be referred to never on his own, but always as portrayed by Stanley Baker. And uh, Gonville Bromhead, an officer of the 24th, portrayed by Michael Caine in the movie. And the two of them, as well as some other non NCOs and other senior men, prepare over a course of about two hours of notice when there are refugees fleeing from the battlefield in the Sundawana, basically saying, run for your lives, the Zulus are coming. And they decide to, to stick it out and do the best they can in this small mission station. Now they're fortunate because they have a large supply of not only mealy bags and biscuit boxes, but also of ammunition. So they're gonna make a go of it. 4.30 in the afternoon, the attack begins and continues to the early morning hours. 
unfortunately, the movie Zulu and its connection to the real history sort of stops at the point of uh, there are men actually named Gonzo Bromhead and John Chard, and a few of the other characters are are, are full figures, uh, Color Sergeant Bourne and so forth. Um, but And there is an attack on the hospital. It does burn to the ground. Other dynamics of the timing are sort of historically accurate, but there's no Men of Harlech at the end. So whoever is on this Zoom thinking about Men of Harlech written after the Zulu War, it doesn't really happen, but it is brave and tremendous stuff. The Zulus are, and I know this because I've heard it directly from uh, his mouth, Prince Makazutu Butelezi, who plays his great grandfather in the movie. He's just turning 95 and wrote the letter of introduction. It's also on our YouTube channel, a, vid uh, a, a video welcome that he did for the exhibition, is very proud to have played his famous ancestor in the movie. And there is a recognition that though it is a dramatic Hollywoodized version of this amazing history, that it continues to connect the Zulu people to popular culture around the world to this day. Um, so it is pretty dramatic. Now, let's look at some artifacts. So when we're coming to how do you portray uh, this important battle, uh, there are 11 Victoria Crosses uh, that our, uh, the recipients are uh, receive. It is the most Victoria Crosses awarded to a single unit in a single engagement in the history of the British military, including all of World War I and World War II. Um, there are uh, items in the, in the exhibition which focus us on that history. This is a picture of what Gonville Bromhead, played by Michael Caine, really looked like. And this is a letter written by Gonville Bromhead three months to the day after the battle, written from Rorkstrift to his sister, in it referencing that they haven't seen their friends, the Zulus, very recently. But in terms of attributable artifacts, what connects us now in 2023 to a place and a time? How do we feel and how do we connect with history? And I would argue, and yes, we are here at the Royal Philatelic Society of London for everyone in our live audience here, but also for everyone listening to us and watching on Zoom, there is nothing like the postal artifact in all of military history collecting and study because it is as attributable from a dated piece of letter of envelope written by the participant writing to someone expressing their views, giving their sense of a moment in time. And it is as physical of a place as you can possibly get. It was written at that place, Dateline from Rorkstrift by Gonville Bromhead. It's as, it's as close as you can possibly get to being there with him is to have is to have it be in front of this letter. Now, um, Ammunition Smith is another very famous person. This is a postcard that he wrote. He was famous for handing out ammunition along the barricades at Rourke's Drift. This is the most dramatic letter uh, that survives in private hands, as well as the envelope that carried it. It is written by Colonel Glynn. Colonel Glynn went out with Lord Chelmsford on the 22nd. So he goes out in the wrong direction. They come back that night and they sleep and they camp with the remaining portion of their force surrounded by the dead bodies of their fellow soldiers and the Zulu warriors, a dramatic and terrifying experience. Um, and they, they strike the camp and leave before sunup to avoid demoralizing their entire force with the carnage around them. They then get to Rourke Strip, which had just survived. So he's basically 12 hours late in a, in a sense to both of the major battles of those 24 hours. He's writing a letter before the official report is written by Glenn. He's writing to a fellow officer of the 24th. Many of the men that died in Sandawani he had served with for 10 and 15 years. Notice the cross hatching of the letter that he writes. He writes in one and then he turns it perpendicular and continues writing. Their entire field kit has been destroyed at Sandawana. Half of Rourke Strip has been burned down. The, the scarcity of paper at that moment and how scarce of a resource of not only his time, but they aren't sure that the Zulus aren't coming back. They're preparing themselves to have a second invasion and attack by the Zulu army. Desperation in the camp. Glenn is in complete depression. There's a lot of research that's been done about Glenn's depression. And he is being hounded by General Chelmsford to write a report on both the Battle of Ascendawana and Rourke's Drift. And Glenn can't pull himself together, but he does write a letter to his friend, Captain Harrison. In this letter, he describes both battles. It's a remarkable letter. And he lists all the fellow officers that had died. There's a remarkable element of this letter to point out uh, for everyone here. And it's really one of the most kind of uh, striking elements of the Zulu War. When King Shaka was assassinated by his brothers, and he says, are, are, the, are, the, are the sons of my father, the sons of my mother, are they really striking me down? I have never done anything to you. He says, though, I will tell you that though you strike me down, the whites will come upon you like locusts and you will do nothing about it. You can do nothing about it. 55 years later, approximately, 
Lynn is writing about his emotional reaction to what has happened. And in this letter, not knowing what Shaka had said in an oral history context, there's no way he could have known. In this letter, he remarks, the Zulus come on like locusts and they come and take the field. Consider how history and how devastation and war is like pestilence, like locusts. And however you think about it, that really all of this, all war and everything we're here to sort of think about and sort of take in through these artifacts is really devastation. And it is all dramatic, certainly, and it's amazing history. Um, but whether you were on the Zulu side in King Shaka or his descendants in King Quechueo or his warriors, or you're the British soldiers and their families, we're gonna talk about their families in a moment. This war is just that, senseless and destruction and devastation and death. So anyway, now we've gone about that. We have a, a letter written by John Chard, who also would receive the Victoria Cross. There's a, an item of kit here. So though the postal artifact is about as attributable as it gets, mm. anyone in person here, by the way, that sticks it out till the end, if you do, I will get this one object out of the case. Sorry to all those on Zoom. It's going to be the one disadvantage that you have of not physically being here. But this is about the most remarkable item I could put in someone's hands to connect you with not just the Anglo Zulu War in that moment, but that exact day of January 22nd, the day of Isandawana and the Battle of Rourke's Drift. This is a piece of kit that belonged to Private William Beckett. He received it on his first day with the regiment, the 24th Regiment in Brecon in Wales. It is inscribed to him, one of the very few pieces of a Victorian soldier's kit that is inscribed to the soldier because you do not want to mix it up with other soldiers because it's how you, where you keep your eating and cleaning utensils. So you would put it into this uh, house of kit, into little sleeves in the center where the, I'm sorry for my, where my finger is sort of in the center here. And then you would roll it up and you would take it with you um, into your pack. Private Beckett was a patient in the hospital um, when the attack began and was one of the defenders in the hospital, the movie gets it quite well with the claustrophobia and sort of the desperation of the attack inside the hospital. He is stabbed in that attack, makes his way out, hides in the brush, and by the morning is still alive when he is found, uh, but bleeds out. Of the 17 men that would die from the, at the Battle of Rourke's Drift, of the of British and colonial soldiers, many, many more Zulus would die. Um, he's one of the few that dies of a stab wound. Most were killed by gunshot wounds from the Zulus. This was sent back with his personal effects. He would have used it that morning. They had no idea the battle was coming when he woke up that morning to use uh, his personal house of kit. Was sent back with his personal effects. His family kept his posthumously awarded. He never touched his medal. He never saw his campaign medal. It never went to South Africa. Kept his medal wrapped in this house of kit for 120 years until they sold it in 1999. It is as directly connected to that place, surviving the burning of the hospital, the devastation at Rourke's Drift, the destruction of the tents outside when they struck before the battle began, and this belonged to Private Beckett. And it reminds us that, again, the mundane, the everyday object in our own lives really are what makes us humans and what connects us to this dramatic history is something that is attributable to that moment in time. So even if you've walked the battlefields at Rourke's Drift and Isandawana, you've walked the ground and felt that dramatic history this artifact connects us to one moment and one time related to one, a sad participant that's still buried to this day at Rourke's Drift. Um, I need to just do a quick check on my time. Great, on my time. I spent a lot of time in this early part of the history here. I'm gonna now speed up and my apologies to everyone. If you're in the gallery, of course, you can ask me more questions. I'm gonna sort of just try to get through this. Uh, as I said, there's so much to show. The first uh, um, time we, we showed the, uh, the, the, uh, um, this two weeks ago, I was able to go through a little bit more of everything. I was trying to give a little more deep history on the start of the war. I'm going to speed up a little bit, but Joan, do not worry. I will attempt to keep the pace of my voice as close to slow as possible. But there's so much more, as you can see, as I pan the rest of the gallery, and we're really only at February 1879, and the exhibition goes until 2023 for its objects. Talking about dramatic history. Now, this was a war that was not meant to be started. It is a shock when it gets back to London. On February 11th, 1879, the wire hits London. And this is a letter written by the wife of the master of the royal household, writing about the news being learned for the first time in Queen Victoria's court in Windsor. She is describing the reaction to this dramatic news of the defeat and destruction of the center column's force at the Battle of Sandawana. She's writing to her mother about her cousin, Henry. Incredibly, the wife of the master of the royal household who learns of this news on February 11th, 1879, 
was the cousin of Henry Pullane, the senior officer killed at Sandawana. And think about the small world that the British diplomatic and royal court had that her cousin is in this far-flung battlefield and one of the tragic participants killed at the Battle of Sandawana. The following day, she sends another letter. February 12th is the first day that the British press have hold of this news, and so all the newspaper accounts start hitting on the 12th. She writes a second letter, and notice how the black border of mourning stationery is already being used, that the, the sense of grief, not only the loss of her cousin, but just the dramatic hit that this had to just British society and the, and the loss that they instantly felt. Two objects that are in the ephemera space, but again, referencing how the devastation of all this is affecting people way beyond members of the royal court. We have two charity programs for charity concerts and theatrical events put on by amateur organizations to raise money for the widows and orphans of private soldiers and non-commissioned officers. So the non, basically the people that were not wealthy, that really at the time in 1879 did not have the system set up to be able to even have the compensation from the government go to their families. So raising money through private initiatives uh, for those widows and orphans that were made by the death and devastation of that battle. They are two of the rarest items in the exhibition because they are so ephemeral that they really were the things that were not meant to be kept. They were made for the, that one day to raise money for this effort and then moved on. We have a newspaper, which is one of the earliest references to the colonial defenses that were taking place in the days after the Battle of Rourke Strip near Sandawana. With the center force destroyed and the Zulus already invading the colony to attack Rourke Strip, the colony had no idea what to expect. Would the Zulus cross the border again? Would they invade and sack one of the major cities? They had no idea. So this is a, a, a newspaper sent shortly after the news uh, hits the colony just a few days later in January, late January. And this is describing the early preparations. Now, really to be dramatic, I didn't talk about this uh, two weeks ago, but the kit that you all see down here all belongs to, remember the Buffalo Border Guard that went out with Lord Chelmsford on the morning of the 22nd. So he was not there at the Battle of the Sandawana, but he did return that evening when the force camps again amongst the devastation of that battlefield. And I want to point you at his boots. Those are the boots that were kept by his family through his service there and into the 20th century. Um, and the ones that he wore when he walked the field in those late hours of that night uh, when he camped, just to imagine what he stepped through and what these, what these field boots saw in the blood uh, and devastation of that battlefield. There's a reinvasion force that is sent, and that this case is a big focus on all of the artifacts, letters, medals, uh, uh, the watercolors uh, done by members of the reinvasion force. Uh, that includes a series of other battles that take place in March and April of 1879 while the reinvasion is getting underway. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly point us at um, two items here in the bottom. We have a colorized photograph of a, of a Sergeant Booth, at this point now Color Sergeant Booth, and an envelope uh, signed by a Lieutenant Harwood, both of the 80th Regiment. Now, why are these two objects important? Well, <laughs> um, it all is related to the battle that is shown over here, which is the Battle of Ntombe River. There was a detachment of the 80th in March of 1879. This again is where they're waiting for the reinforcements. It's sort of the, the war is at a pause and they are stuck in an overflowing river with a wagon, a supply train, and they've loggered them and they're kind of trying, you know, taking, taking, taking them more than a couple of days to get this going. They are attacked by a Zulu force that of course has noticed that they are there. Um, there are three principal officers to, of note here. One is Captain Moriarty, who's killed very early in the battle. So first officer killed. The second officer, Lieutenant Harwood, which I just showed you that envelope that he countersigned and sent shortly after the battle, decides that he's going to run and go get uh, some reinforcements. He will be later court-martialed for abandoning his post. And then there is a sergeant uh, who leads a, a relatively successful, though most of the forces still killed, uh, fighting retreat. Um, and that is Sergeant Booth. Uh, and he would re receive the Victoria Cross. So three of the dramatic elements of what could happen to you as an officer, non-commissioned officer in, in the Victorian uh, military, you're either killed, you're either court-martialed, or you win the Victoria Cross. And these two objects reflect two of the participants. Again, Moriarty, Captain Moriarty would be killed. But this uh, colorized image shows uh, Booth after he has been promoted to color sergeant, but before he has received the Victoria Cross. So a pretty dramatic kind of moment to be able to date this particular object. There are all sorts of other interesting objects to point out uh, here, including a letter sent by John Chard, again of Rourke Strift fame, writing to another senior officer uh, in the Royal Engineers. 
continuing to advance our, our story is a really weird part of the story, which I'm going to zoom through very quickly, which is that after 1871 and the Franco-Prussian War, the, uh, the emperor uh, was deposed. His wife and teenage son come to England uh, in exile. His, the, their son, Louis Napoleon, the Prince Imperial, trains in the military academy at Woolwich. This is a leave slip that is uh, filled out uh, by the uh, cadet Napoleon. Uh, which is just great, him signing Napoleon Cadet, asking for some additional leave. He asks uh, his mother to petition Queen Victoria to allow him to accompany the reinvasion of Zululand as an observer. Where does the story end? Well, for most of the Napoleon family, not so well. That is a photograph of the Prince Imperial's body uh, in Zululand after it had been recovered. He went on a patrol he really should not have gone on. He was uh, found uh, at a, a Zulu homestead where they had stayed too long by a Zulu uh, scouting uh, 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 patrol and uh, was killed. They did not realize who they had killed till afterwards. Um, so the Prince Imperial, effectively Napoleon IV, dies in Zululand. The campaign continues into early July. This case is a focus on that last campaign. The reinforcements have arrived. They surround the Zulu capital and they basically are going to bring the war to one final culminating battle, the Battle of Alundi on July 4, 1879. There are so many things to show in this case that I just simply cannot show them all, but if I, I could do a whole hour just on what you see here. This photograph is the only action photograph of the entire war. In the top left corner, you see some smoke coming out in the distance. That is the burning of the Royal Homestead at the Battle of Alundi. Um, you see this envelope right here with uh, this hand illustrated envelope. Uh, actually, it is, it is sent before news of the Battle of Alundi and its success has reached London. So, it's, so they don't know, the, they know the war is coming to an end and the reinforcements have arrived, but notice what this person has drawn on it. It's a British soldier with a pin that says glory and a peg leg. And it's actually taken from an illustration in Punch Magazine that shows something very similar. There was tremendous angst and anxiety and anti-war sentiment that almost immediately per it permeated British society for what have we done? Why are we in Zululand? Why have we brought this upon ourselves? And for what cost of not only men, treasure, um, and, and it really, it, it's, it's not just a modern sense of an anti-war feeling. There was immediate anti-war feeling from the very start of the war and the postal artifacts and their impressions set a quite a bit of that. So lots of other items, including newspapers sent, um, including one sent to Canada, showing this news. So the war comes to an end. The Zulu king uh, is, is, uh, escapes from, from the battlefield and is not captured. This next section talks about the, uh, the, the dead and the devastation. The Empress Eugenie visits Zululand in 1880 and is on the exact spot where her son is killed one year to the day of his death. There is a dramatic image here, which is done by Melton Pryor, a battlefield sketch artist. This is his original image uh, that he sketched at the battlefield when in May of 1879, they returned to bury uh, the bodies of all the men that had been left there since January of 1879. The Zulu King is eventually captured. This is an entire case focused on his story. He's taken to Cape Town uh, and, and he is there until 1882 in sort of a house arrest. He learns how to only write his name. It's the only English script he ever learned how to write. These are examples of his handwriting of his name. And he wrote them out as souvenirs. This blue piece of paper actually is how he did it is he would write his name out over and over and over again. And when he would receive a visitor, he would cut out one of the signatures he had written and he'd hand it to them. Over here, and this is, a, this is sorry, that's the Zulu king right there. Over here is a letter sent into the castle asking the king to return his signature. And the king signs the letter itself that had been sent in and sends it back to the participants. It's the only known letter signed by King Quechua. He eventually petitions the, the government and Britain to allow him to visit England, which he does, incredibly. They bring him to England, and he meets Queen Victoria. And what happens at the end of all of this? They agree to allow him to return to Zululand and to be reinstalled as the king of the Zulu kingdom. So um, what is the purpose of all of this that I have told you? And the answer is nothing. Uh, it, is, it was senseless from the beginning and continue to be so unnecessary. Um, and it's not meant to provide personal bias. I'm just trying to give a sense of some of the emotion of kind of all this has wrought and for what and for what means. Now, this does not mean that the Zulu king is warmly welcomed back in Zululand. By the way, to give a sense, you have these two illustrated items right here, one showing the king coming back in sort of this very stereotypical, almost racist imagery of him kind of in a cartoon, making his way back to Zululand in Western clothes. 
But as soon as he gets back, what does he do with those Western clothes? He takes them off and throws them down and says, I can do without them. So very interesting commentary from just a member of the public putting an illustration on the front of an envelope. This is not exactly a hidden message in some buried in some envelope, or buried you know, in some letter. This is for the, you know, anyone that looks at the envelope could see this. There is a Zulu civil war. Um, this entire case focuses on the Zulu war, the, Zulu, the, the king's death in 1884, and everything that comes afterwards. There's too much to show in the short time that we have, but I'll just show one really interesting thing for the purposes of the uh, postal audience here. What you see here is the only known military outbound cover envelope sent from Zululand to, of all places, Kentucky, United States. It's the only outbound uh, piece of military mail from Zululand uh, sent to the United States, and it's sent postage due with both British and, uh, and American postage due marks, a, a pretty remarkable item uh, in terms of the postal history. We have a legacy component that is all in this case with so much to look at. What happens to the Zulu participants? What happens to the British survivors of these battles? And that's the focus of everything we have here. And trying to understand what is the relevance of the Zulus as they are in British society. And the answer is, there is a tremendous reverence for the Zulus from the very start of the war, all the way through the King's visit in 1882. There was a parade when he was here. There was a cheering crowd outside of King Ketchweo's home, so much so that he had to go out at least twice a day to satiate the, the cheering crowd's demand for his attention uh, when he was here. So a lot of interest in King Ketchweo. There's also a Zulu, Texas. There are other other places uh, that you can, there's a letter sent to Zulu, Texas in the 19 teens. Other objects uh, related to HMS Zulu, there are multiple warships named after the Zulus by the British. There's a Masonic scroll that was given to John Chard, Victoria Cross recipient, played by Mike, played by Stanley Baker. This is the, the scroll that was given. There are, there are hundreds of artifacts. Probably half of this exhibition has never been displayed before in any form. Many of the charred artifacts, as well as the Rourke Strip artifacts, have come straight from the families uh, to be here in this exhibition or through me to the exhibition. Um, so they are uh, also never before seen in a public museum setting. So thrilled for everyone that's here live and, of course, to show you all this virtually. And to finish out, of course, we have to show a little bit from Zulu. Um, we have a couple of postal items we have for Zulu Dawn, which is about which comes out in the 19, 1979 about the Battle of Isandawana. This is a promotional envelope that was sent with early, uh, basically video cassette tapes uh, promoting the distribution. Imagine this envelope with this dashing Zulu Dawn with a spear crashing through it. Imagine that envelope landing on your desk at the distribution company. How could you possibly not pay attention to what's inside of it? I, I wish that our envelopes and how we thought about the dramatic nature of mail still had this kind of dramatic action taking place. And then a little bit for our revenue stamp collectors on the call, something that really should have been thrown away a long time ago, amazing that it still exists, is a ticket for the opening of Zulu in Bangkok, Thailand. And what is on the edge of that ticket? Thai tax stamps for this movie ticket. Incredible. So there's so many ways to show this history. We have a letter by, uh, signed by Prince Makazutu Butelezi, who played his great-grandfather that I mentioned earlier in the movie Zulu. He is also, as I said, uh, wrote the letter of welcome for our exhibition. We have two original scripts for the movie, but we end where we began, which is with the Zulus. These are 20th century objects of Zulu cultural life, um, from earplugs, beadwork. And it again, it's to show and remind us that there still are 8 to 10 million ethnic or descendant Zulus living in South Africa, that their life goes on dramatically altered and shaped by this incredible history, dramatic and, uh, and really devastating for them, of course, and for their kingdom. Um, but they thrive to this day, and their, so does their traditional culture um, and their pride in the success they had, a war that they did not, that did not come at their, by their fault or initiation, but a war they fought nonetheless. And that does not make the average British soldier who fought and died or fought and lived on as a veteran afterwards, any less important, heroic or otherwise. That really is a dramatic history. And Prince Butelezi puts it best, though uh, tragic and dramatic, it is a history that is shared by the British and the Zulu peoples forever, connecting the British and the Zulu peoples for all time. One last very special thing that I did not have out last time, but thrilled to have here and thrilled to highlight to everyone in the gallery that I took out to have for today, this is a very famous painting. It's actually, it's a print of the famous painting done by Neville. It was commissioned by the Fine Arts Society in 1879. Um, and he then corresponded with numerous participants of the war. So I'm gonna show you this is right here. That is John Chard at the barricades at Rourke's Drift. And here is 
Um, that's Gonville Bromhead. And there are other famous figures from the war that are depicted here. Here's Ammunition Smith. I have, a, I have the postcard from Ammunition Smith. This is the print. This is a pretty dramatic object. This is the print that was made by the Fine Arts Society and sold at the exhibition when it went on display. Over 50,000 members of the public paid an admission charge to see Neville's famous color uh, oil painting. It was bought by the Gallery of New South Wales in the 1880s and to this day is still in Sydney, Australia at their National Gallery. If you want to see the painting, that's where you have to go. And it is one of their most uh, uh, visited, viewed, uh, most famous paintings in their gallery. This was signed by Alphonse Neville in the corner right there. It was also signed by the engraver right there and was the presentation copy given by the chairman of the Fine Arts Society to John Chard when Chard visited the Fine Arts Society to view the painting at the core of what made him so famous. And this is John Chard's personal copy of this famous image. Um, so again, I'm never gonna be able to have the heist work out so well for me to have the painting leave the Gallery of New South Wales and come into a private collection, but that's okay. Because again, connecting with the people that made this history, the history that it is, and to have the connections and the legacy, and in this case, John Chard's personal copy of this famous painting will have to do in the meantime. Uh, it has been my tremendous pleasure and honor to be part of this uh, exercise. My thanks to Joan uh, Harmer for her invitation, inclusion, help, and Rob, thank you again for your introduction. There is so much that postal history can do to connect directly to history in all of its dramatic forms. We've had, as I said, almost 2,000 members of the public come through here, and it is the objects of this history, postal and otherwise, that have connected them to this dramatic history. Just again, to show you our gallery here, but we have uh, had a remarkable opportunity to engage the world, and I'm so thankful to everyone here. I'll take a few questions from our live audience as well. If you're not, uh, you're just as important, even though you have not been getting my eye contact during this tour. Um, so thank you, John. I'll leave, I'll leave it to you. Oh, How close am I? Yeah. To, oh, four o'clock on the dot. Look at that. I did it exactly in my. There we go. You're perfect, Alex. I mean, you're uh, you're just amazing, and the the whole exhibit is amazing. Well, I'm going. There there are some questions in the Q and A, and I'm going to let Robert. Uh, handle those. Robert so, is awesome. What, 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 what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I will alternate though. So I'm going to take a question okay. here. I'll repeat the question. I'll bet there's some similar questions we're about to hear both audience. So, so Rob, if you don't mind, so Rob, if you'd start, sir, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah, maybe slightly controversial. Please. What are your thoughts as to the, I think. I'll repeat the question. What are your thoughts as to the very strong thought process the question is for the 11 Victoria Cross that are awarded at Rourke's Drift, um, what are my thoughts, which is a very dangerous subject for the, the nerds of anglo Zulu War history, of, of how much those Victoria Crosses were, were sort of given out, were they given out to sort of cover up from the disaster early in the day to Sandawana? In, or, in terms of sort of focus the British public's attention on this dramatic underdog victory and my answer to that is, I think many of the men that received the Victoria Cross there performed tremendous, admirable action um, and deserving very much of, of, this, of this history to be a part of, of their Victoria Cross um, glory and well-deserved. I would say that, sure, there's definitely an element of how the military and the political atmosphere wants to play up this history. While I'm answering questions, I'm going to keep showing people galleries. Um, I would say... Um, I'll let uh, the historians continue to debate that question. Were one or two of the Victoria Crosses awarded for men doing their duty? Maybe, but were most given uh, to men that really were deserving? Absolutely. I think, yeah, so I, I would say that's my best answer. So uh, Rob, now to a question from the audience, and I will repeat the question to the, to the live audience as well. So Rob, the question, please. All right, thanks, Alex. A question here from Arthur Patrick. He noticed the word Bladensburg on the regimental banner. Is this the same historical unit that attacked and burned the U.S. Capitol during the War of 1812? The question is about Bladensburg, which is one of the uh, battle honors on the initial start of our, uh, our guide. And yes, that is Bladensburg, Maryland, one of the very few American connections I've been able to make to this exhibition. And trust me, I try very hard to put every American connection I possibly can into it. Uh, so yes, that is, that is related to the War of 1812. So yes, you, you've nailed it. Good, good eye uh, notice to the questioner. Uh, so any question, more questions in the gallery? Yes, sir. How did you go about assembling this collection 
um, in the first place. I noticed your accent, sir. Where are you from? I'm from Colorado. Oh, really? There's, I have, not, not only do I have a, a, the questioner from Colorado, and the question was, how did I go about assembling all of this? But actually, I have my aunt and uncle, who coincidentally are also from Colorado, live in the gallery with me here. So it's, it's looking like a setup, but, uh, that, but that's what we have. The answer is not an easy one uh, to answer. And I actually would say that, Joan, if you're interested as a follow-on when I get back to the United States, and if the audience has any interest, I'd be happy to do sort of a um, kind of a how did I do this? Uh, how do you cross into over 50 different categories of collecting from tribal art to military, postal and ephemera. And the answer is you just look everywhere. And honestly, the most incredible, so the question was again, how did I assemble all this? The thing about it is we sometimes get too pigeonholed into the ways that we find items in our collection. So for a stamp collector, for a postal collector, for a military collector, whatever it is, you begin just going back to the same old places, auctions, uh, collector fairs, collecting resources, online forums. And in reality, every collecting world has a little bit of every other collecting world in it. So some of the best items I found, postal items, for example, came not from the traditional postal world, but from the ephemera and the military world. Some of the best military items that I found have come from the philatelic and postal world. So it's the crossing of my time and my saint of a wife. So if you're, Sarah, if you're ever listening to this recording that Joan has prepared here, it is absolutely my wife that has allowed me uh, to be able to spend the time necessary to dive into these other collecting worlds. Otherwise, I would never have been able to really assemble and engage. And every world has something to offer. I have learned so much about how to interpret the postal artifacts by talking with experts in the military history collecting world. And I've learned so much about the military history collecting world from the philatelic and postal world. And those are just giving two examples. So the answer is a lot of looking. If you don't leave immediately, I have, are you, are you here this Sunday in London? I'm not. Oh, I was gonna say there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a collector's fair here that I was gonna tell you about. I'll still tell you about it in case you come back to London. Um, but anyway, so there's lots of ways to find this history. I'm just trying to give everyone viewing on, on Zoom here a continued look at some of the artifacts. Um, so thank you for that question. I hope it gave you a little bit of an answer. It did, yeah. Um, so another question, Rob, from the, from the uh, virtual audience. Yeah, we've got, we've got a question here from Howard Myers. Hi, what, hi, Howard. What happened to the general and the politician who initiated the conflict? The question is, what happened to the, uh, the uh, Bar Sir Bartle Frere and uh, General Chelmsford that initiated the conflict? Well, <laughs> uh, Sir Bartle Frere kind of finishes out his career. He's kind of co completed confederation. Um, there's a bit of dishonor, but he does have a statue on embankment that's, that, that's there to this day here in London. So he's not well remembered by some history, but well remembered for his earlier and competent uh, management of, of, of earlier colonial uh, possessions of the British Empire. Uh, General Chelmsford is relieved of, effectively relieved of duty uh, and finds his way back to England. I have a letter here. I will. That is of him right after he returns to London, within days of coming back to London. And General Chelmsford knows that he has a lot of explaining to do for his actions in the campaign. And in this letter, he's writing to Sir Henry Ponsonby. If any, if any one of you saw uh, Victoria and Abdul uh, um, uh, a couple uh, within the last couple of years, uh, Sir Ponsonby uh, is, is a, pl a prominent role in that movie. Anyway, he's just saying, I know I have much to explain to my friends about my conduct on this campaign. I hope you will allow me the opportunity to do so. So he spent the rest of his life basically trying to explain uh, and, and rescue his reputation. He was fortunate in that he was a favorite of Queen Victoria and kind of had a gilded retirement, even though he never commanded men uh, in the course of battle ever again. His reputation was, so, you know, history has not uh, not been favorable to him, unfortunately, but or unfortunate for him. Um, so that's really the answer to the question of, uh, of what happened to the two of them. But he lives into the early 20th century and dies relatively peacefully. Um, other questions in the gallery? Or are we taking other? Let's hear the uh, Rob, give me another question from the, uh, from the virtual side. Sure. Uh, from Dustin. Did the British Army have Gatling machine guns and mortars for their defense at the hospital? No. So there's the machine guns are not, there's no machine guns. Uh, uh, the Gatling gun is not used um, in the central column. It's used at, uh, it, later in the conflict. Um, and actually, it's interesting as I'm right here, this is a scientific American uh, from June 14th, 1879. It's actually in it has an article about the Gatling gun and the technology of the Gatling gun and references dis dispatches from the campaign in Zuland and the earliest use, the very first use by the British military of the Gatling gun in, uh, in an armed conflict. And it takes place at the latter point in the war. So it's used in the second half part of the, 
overwhelming material uh, that is brought to bear on the Zulu army. Uh, but no, in the initial phase, there's no uh, no heavy machine gun, just the breech loading uh, Martini Henry, which still was a pretty advanced uh, piece of weaponry in comparison to the Zulu's sort of first one and two generation behind muskets and, and so forth. Thank you for that question. Other questions? Another question is, when is the last day of this exhibit? This exhibit runs through Monday, July 31. Uh, so if you are, in fact, in London or have any way of coming, I would certainly uh, uh, welcome you to the exhibition and hope you can come. If you know anyone, if you're listening to this and you know anyone that lives in the UK or could come to the exhibition, um, you're obligated, uh, whether, you think, whether you realize it or not, to tell them. Uh, we're open tomorrow and Saturday and Monday. Uh, and I'll just tease this, which is different than two, two weeks ago, that there is a discussion that's begun uh, here in the UK uh, with another institution to have a, a joint exhibition in the future uh, so that this exhibition may not be the last time that we do something special like this. So if you did not able to get to it in person this time, I, I won't say when or necessarily if, um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll find a way potentially to showing all of this again in, in a different form. Um, so thank you for that question. Other, uh, other questions? Um, that was the last of the written questions, Alex. Um, oh, good. Well, I, I'm, uh, is, uh, I realize there's a social element to this, and I really appreciate everyone being a part of it. I have to turn my attention to the live audience here um, to sort of uh, allow them to take me up on the offer to touch a little bit of history. Um, so uh, I will uh, just uh, I will bid you adieu. Uh, and Joan, thank you so very much again for initiating this and being brave enough to tackle something that was live to, a, a, to an audience and to do it more than once for me to give you multiple heart palpitations as it got minutes before <laughs> each of the uh, of the presentations before I logged on. We've been very busy here and so fortunate to have had so many participants from around the world physically live. This is the future of how we engage postal history and philately and our artifacts is side by side with the other artifacts that make history dramatic, connect us to people, places, heritage and culture. Um, and I'm thrilled to have had done this in partnership with the Royal Phil Talk Society London um, and their uh, brave willingness to allow uh, <laughs> Allow a young American uh, member and fellow to just uh, say, trust me, I promise this will work. And I had enough uh, members and fellows and leaders here, as well as tremendously generous donors. I began with a thank you to our donors. I will end with a thank you to our donors, our presenting sponsor, Cherrystone Auctions, our supporting sponsors, Siegel Auctions, and Scott Treppel and Charles Shreve. Thank you so very much. Um, and Skyler and his team at Skyler Rumsey Auctions, uh, Anna Lee, uh, thank you so much. It just it means the world to me that you made this possible. Every donor to this exhibition, um, all the way down uh, to donors that gave just a couple hundred pounds, made it possible for us to have a free exhibition to bring in the world. We had families here with their kids to remove every barrier so that someone could, who was interested in this history, who wanted to learn something new and engage the artifacts, the postal, philatelic, and otherwise, um, you, the donors, made that possible, and I'll never be able to thank you enough from the bottom of my heart. And to all of you that have watched here, thank you for your participation and being part of the history of this exhibition by being uh, in this virtual environment. Um, my, um, it's Clash of Empires two zero two three at gmail dot com. Clash of Empires twenty twenty three at gmail. That's the official email for the exhibition. Clash of Empires dot org is the exhibition. Um, uh, website. I invite you to go on our YouTube channel. If you go on Clash of Empires Zulu, just type in Clash of Empires Zulu, you'll see a range of videos. I want to say one very important thing about our YouTube channel. We've had about a dozen videos done over the last two weeks about the exhibition and various elements of the exhibition. We are already in excess of 300,000 views on those YouTube videos. They are the most watched YouTube videos um, uh, that the Royal Philatelic Society of London has ever been a part of. They have even beaten the video of Queen Elizabeth visiting, which has been up for four years and has 45,000 views. We have one video that's almost at 200,000 in less than two weeks. So anyone that thinks this history is niche, uh, that it's just, you know, who would show up? You know, what's it all about? Well, the answer is uh, there are fascination with this history. And I'm taking us back to where we began this dramatic part of our story which is this battlefield from 144 years ago and all the artifacts related to it. The Zulu victory to Sundawana continues our fascination and that, that battle at Rourke's Drift and the movie Zulu connect us all the way to 95-year-old Prince Makazu Dubutalezi, the traditional prime minister of the Zulu kingdom. So thank you everyone for joining. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bid you adieu. And again, please send Alex? me an email 
Yes. Hold on. Before we before you go, could we just do a quick we have some people now in the gallery. Could we just see if there's any more questions? Because usually we let the people ask questions live. So Okay, yeah, ask a question one live. One more moment. Anyone have any questions for Alex? A lot of people I don't have this. any questions. I just wanted to say what a marvelous presentation it was. Thank you. Well, you, you've caught me at a moment. Of course, there was just someone complimenting that this was a great presentation. Thank you very much. I will say Frederick that in the Lawrence. end. Yeah. Sorry. No, please continue. Oh, sorry. Frederick? Here. A, a question about the other movie, the Zulu Dawn movie. At the, end of, Zulu Dawn. At the end of the movie, uh, a British officer is shown in his tent looking at a handwritten letter, presumably one he has just written to his wife or his family. A Zulu warrior enters the tent, kills him with a spear. And, and I imagine that's a Hollywood dramatization. But it was is. There anything recovered from the battlefield in, in the way of correspondence that didn't make it into the postal system? Is no, there there's, there's, the there's time no time of the battle. No postal items, no letters in the camp uh, were recovered. The destruction of the camp is pretty um, complete, and they were did not return for another three months. So in terms of stuff blowing away, all the tents are down. I mean, it, it's complete devastation. So nothing recovered in a way that is at least um, known to this day. It's all stuff that comes afterwards. We do have this a wagon canteen that was recovered from the, the battlefield with one of the burial parties, which is right there. So there, I mean, there are objects that were recovered from the Asandawana battlefield, but um, so anyway, well, uh, thank you for that question. Thank you, Alex. And I know you have to be attentive to your in-person audience. So I think we'll take you up on getting you back at some point to, to talk to us uh, either more about this and about how you went about uh, it, organizing. Any, no matter what you collect, if you simply have a curious mind and you're open to getting out of your comfort zone, you can also connect dramatic history outside of what you collect in the philatelic and postal history space and make it even more real for yourself as a student of whatever you collect, but also for anyone you show it to uh, in the future. So thank, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Please reach out to us. Clashofempires.org is the website. Uh, and then clashofempires2023 at Gmail is our email address. Please, Joan, if you'd post that. And we'll see you all later. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank so you. That, a uh, brilliant Alex presentation. Stay with us Thank a little you. longer, but he does have people there live in the gallery, so he wanted to, to give them attention. But we, we will keep this open as long as we want to talk. I think it was a fabulous presentation. Oh, yeah.